Word of God this morning. And uh, I'd like you to turn with me to 1 Samuel, and we're going to look at 1 Samuel 27. 1 Samuel 27. Praise God. We've been going through the, the life of David uh, in a, um, a, a series entitled, basically, you know, uh, David, a man after God's own heart, which is taken from, uh, uh, from Acts chapter 17 and verse 22. Before we do, let's just, just, read, let's just pray. Hallelujah. So, Father, I thank you, Lord, that this is your word. Lord, it's heaven sent. And, Lord, that's what we want to hear from, Lord, it's heaven this morning. We ask, Lord, that as we listen to your word this morning, Lord, my God, we listen not only with our natural ears, Lord, but also our spiritual ears. Lord, my God, that it will, Lord, Lord, impact our hearts this morning. We ask this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Praise God. Verse 1 says, And David said in his heart, Now I shall perish someday at the, by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than I should speedily escape to the land of the Philistines. And Saul will despair of me uh, and seek me, uh, to seek me any more in that part of Israel. So I shall escape out of his hand. And David arose and went with 600 men who were uh, with them to uh, Achish, the son of Machor, uh, the king of Gath. And so David dwelt in Ach with Achish and Gath, he and his men, and each with uh, his household, and David with his two wives, uh, Anohim, uh, the Jezreelite, and Abigail, the Carmelite, Carmelitess, uh, uh, Nabal's widow. And so it was to told that David had fled to Gath. So he sought him no more. Verse 5. Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place, some town in the country, that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? So Achish gave him Ziglag that day. Therefore Ziglag has belonged to the kings of Judah to this day. Now the time came, uh, now at that time, sorry, David dwelt in the country of, uh, of uh, the Philistines, uh, one full year and four months. And David and his men went up and raided uh, the Geshurites, the, Z the Jezurites, and the Amalekites. For those nations were inhabitants of the land from old, as you, as, as you go to Sur, as far as uh, the land of Egypt. When David attacked the land, he, neither, uh, he left neither man nor woman alive, but took away the sheep, the oxen, the, don the donkeys, the camels, and uh, the apparel, and returned and came to Achish. Then Achish would say, Where have you made a raid today? And David would say, Against the southern area of Judah, against the southern area of uh, the Jezreelites, or against the southern area of the Canaanites. And David would save neither man nor woman alive, uh, to bring news to Gath, saying, lest they should inform on us, saying, David did, thus David did. And thus his behavior, all that time he dwelt, or was, sorry, thus was his behavior all the time that he dwelt in the country of the Philistines. So Achish believed David, saying, he has made his people utterly uh, abhor him. Therefore, he will be my servant forever. And I'm just going to read the first few verses here of 1 Samuel 28. It says, now it happened in those days the Philistines gathered their armies together for war to fight with Israel. And Achish said to David, I surely know that you will go out with me to battle, you and your men. And so David said to Achish, surely you will know what your servant can do. And Achish said to David, therefore I will make you one of my chief guardians forever. Hallelujah. May God bless us his word this morning. I said, we've been looking just at the story of David. And uh, for those of you who uh, may not, this will be your first time here, uh, we've been looking at it in a number of seasons. Uh, there's five seasons in David's life. There is the, the Bethlehem stage, where he is a young teenage boy minding his father's sheep. Uh, and then he's plucked from obscurity, and uh, he's anointed as the king over Israel as a young teenage boy. He goes out and fights Goliath. And then we find after that is the next stage of his life is Gibeah. And that Gibeah represents David in the courts of Saul. So he's a teenage boy, 
now given tremendous responsibility in the, the seat of government uh, in Israel. Uh, he's been placed over the armies of Israel. He has a position in the court. And, of course, he's incredibly popular. And we hear that word, he behaved wisely. And uh, the people loved him, but that caused Saul to get very insecure because he heard songs like, you know, Saul has slain his thousands, but David is tens of thousands. And so we find that Saul increasingly becomes more and more demonized, more and more demented, and uh, we see him flinging spears at David, and it becomes clear that, uh, you know, it's no longer safe for David to remain in Gibeah. So he moves from Bethlehem to Gibeah, and then this last stage we've been looking at here is, is really the, the stage we call a dullum. And it represents a, a stage where for a, a period of roughly about 10 years where David is really on the run. He's going from cave to cave. Saul is in pursuit of him. Uh, he's living subsistence. And around him is a band of men, uh, 600 men. And so uh, we've seen that David has a number of tests along the way. And the thing that we've been trying to sort of bring here is this, is that before David could be fulfill that destiny to be king over Israel, there were things that had to be worked out in his, his character and his life. David in Bethlehem was not ready to be king over Israel. And uh, I was just sharing with some folk this, this week, uh, you know, one of the things that you find is, is that there is a... Um, you often find the youngest. Uh, there's a birth order issue. Uh, you know, if you're a, a, a firstborn, there's a tendency for the firstborn to be, uh, he gets away with blue murder, doesn't he? Does, don't you, Eduardo? <laughs> the least of the responsibility is on the youngest. It's usually on the eldest. The eldest is usually the one that's responsible, the one that's, and that's, that's a psychological uh, principle. The one in the middle usually sort of, uh, he, he's the peacemaker between the, the old and the young. And so David was the, the youngest. And uh, for David, you know, I mean, he, they, they didn't give him as much responsibility. When, when, when Samuel came to anoint uh, the next king of Israel, they, they didn't even think to, to, to invite David. They said, well, you know, David, he's a bit goofy. He's, he's out playing, uh, you know, the harp uh, there in the fields. You know, he's, he, he's, he's, a, he's, a, he's, he's quite a, a, a spacey kind of kid. And, you know, we wouldn't even bother inviting him. And yet, you know, he was the one that God had destined to be king of Israel. But as a, a young kid without responsibility, then thrust into uh, Gibeah, then thrust and now having to, to live, you know, on the run. There were lessons that he had to learn. There were things God had to develop in his character. And, uh, and we see really in this, this period of the wilderness of Adullam, where he's going from cave to cave, several times where he's tested. And we've looked at that just over the last few weeks. One of the tests was his, resp his response to authority. And we see that uh, on two occasions, he had opportunity to kill uh, Saul. And, uh, you know, and he was being egged on by his, uh, his compatriots. They were saying, yeah, you know, this is, this is God. This is your opportunity now to, to kill your enemy and to, you know, to be free from all this hassle. And yet David realized, no, you know, he is the Lord's anointed. And what he did is, is he had to separate out saw the man from the office of the king. Hallelujah. Because there's a future destiny ahead of him. Now, so David was a, a reactionary kind of character. He had a, a reflex uh, within him that, you know, he would very quickly respond in the spirit, but he could as quickly and as easily respond in the flesh. And so those were the tests that he needed to, to learn, is to respond in the spirit, respond in, turn, in the light of what is before him, rather than just, you know, the moment. And so in, that, in those two occasions, David 
he did very well. He had victory. Hallelujah. There are other times where he did the very opposite. When he went to the city of Nob, he decided he was going to lie. And that lie cost uh, the lives of 85 uh, of the priests. Um, there were other occasions where, you know, the, the actions that he took had impact on others. And last week we, we looked at uh, uh, 1 Samuel 26. And again, it's that same scenario, the second time. And again, please understand that, you know, when God works in our lives, some people sort of think, well, you know, I've had this experience, okay, I've passed this test, and that's it. But that's not, that's not how life works. How many know that? Sometimes, you know, you, ha- you have one test, and then you have the same test again, and the same test again. And again, yes. <laughs> you see, the devil doesn't stop. He does not give up. And if he thinks he can get a, a chink in your armor, he's in like Flynn. Okay? And so, you know, this area, because you see, I mean, Saul's an absolute jerk. And that's, that's putting it bluntly. He's a nasty piece of work. He's demented. He's, he's obsessed about David. And, uh, you know, even though his family are saying, look, leave him alone. He's done nothing wrong. And each time, you know, David responds in a, in a godly manner. And he says, Saul, you know, what have I done? You know, what have I done? You know, I had the opportunity to, to kill you, and I didn't. He says, because I don't want to touch the Lord's anointed. I'm not going to, you know, that, your blood is not going to be on my hands. It's not going to be a result of my taking matters into my own hands. I'm not going to make it happen. If God wants to do it, let him do it. But it's not going to be me. I'm going to honor your position. Hallelujah. And so uh, Saul realizes, he says, I've played the fool. I've greatly erred. And he, remember last week we saw that he did that in, in public. He did that in the, in the, in the view of 3,000 of his men. David stood on that high hill, and he holds up the spear of, of Saul, and he says, Saul, I've taken your spear. There's been a miracle there in that last chapter, because David and his, um, his nephew uh, have walked into a camp of 3,000 men. And Saul is in the middle of that, that camp, and here he is. They've walked right through the middle of that camp, and here's 3,000 men asleep. Now, you think that they're going to wake up. Can you imagine walking in amongst a camp of 3,000 and no one waking, no one stirring? Because Saul is right in the very center of that camp. And so he walks in and he takes the spear and he takes the jug. And he stands he says, Saul, I could have killed you, and I didn't. Saul says, I've played the fool. Praise God. And all his men hear that. Amen? And so... That's the prelude to this chapter we've just read. So really, saw David has had a major moral victory. This is a, a big tick in terms of God's pleasure upon his life. He's responded correctly. He's responded well. But here we have a strange scenario. After this massive moral victory, where God has actually miraculously... 3,000 men to sleep, David suddenly has a, a brain fade. He just basically does a complete turnaround, a complete flip-flop. And, uh, you know, it's like we, we talked there this morning about that light switch. You know, in chapter 26, the choice that he made was the light of the gospel, the light of God's kingdom coming and him seeing the correct thing to do, and he does it. But it's almost like in this chapter, the very beginning, he switches that light off. And suddenly he's now darkened in his thinking, darkened in his understanding, and he just does the total opposite of what he should do. And so, you know, that's in essence probably a a reflection of some of our character. You know, I always say, you know, we are often just a split second away from doing something foolish. From madness. You know, 
there's a fine line between the spirit and the flesh. And, you know, it's like, you know, in times of temptation and times of stress and times of, you know, where decisions are required, we either respond in the spirit or we respond in the flesh. And when we respond in the spirit, there's the blessing of God. There's peace. There's joy. There's love. There's a positive outcome. There's healing. There's restoration. There's forgiveness. That's all the things, all the attributes of the God's kingdom are activated just like the light switch. It's like the power comes on. The light comes. Hope comes as we respond in the spirit. But equally, in that split second, we can choose the flesh. We can choose the darkness. We can choose to indulge in ourselves, in our selfishness. And equally, that has consequences. And those consequences are destructive. They bring us down. They, they don't do us good. They block us from, from the things of God. We stumble around in the darkness. We, we end up in futility. And this is really what happens with David, okay? And, uh, you know, be underst please understand here, there's a, a principle here. Often when you've had a, a victory, often when, you know, God has spoken into your life, you've responded well, and you've made, you know, a step forward in your growth and development and experience and encounter of God. You make a step forward, and guess what? The enemy comes in with backlash. And really, this is what has happened with David. Backlash kicks in. Uh, times of victory are often followed by backlash. And, you know, we really shouldn't be surprised. You see, when, when there's a victory, when you see God do something in you, you know, there's a, a requirement, a need, really, to take a hold of that and really, in a sense, consolidate Often in what they used to do in the Old Testament is, is they would establish an altar. They would actually build an altar. They'd get a bunch of rocks and they would say, you know, this God met me here. God met me in this place. And I can come back and I can be reminded of this, this time, this encounter with God. This is what he said. This is what he did. Now, if you want to map your spiritual journey, it's exactly the same. There will be altars along your spiritual journey where you know that God, God has met with you, that God has done something powerful in your life. And you can go back and trace that. Hallelujah. And every time that you've done that and you've, you've established an altar, you've marked that, that spot. Hallelujah. You know, you move forward. And the old enemy comes back to try and remind you, say, uh-uh. I remember that day. I remember when I, you know, stood before the Lord and I said, God, here's my life. You take it. I remember that time where I was in prayer and you came to me and you spoke to me and you revealed my direction. Hallelujah. I remember that time you touched my life. And those things are important to remember. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so we find here at this very beginning of this chapter, we find David I suppose, vulnerable. He's come down off the high, if you like. He's been functioning and flowing in a, a sense of God's anointing, and now he's coming down, bound down to earth, as it were. So he's a weary David, a vulnerable David. And what he does is that he flip-flops and uh, just begins that uh, flesh reaction, reflex, kicks in. And this is what it says in verse 1. He says, And David thought to himself. David thought to himself. Or David spoke to himself. David spoke to his soul. You see that often in the Psalms where David speaks to his soul. David in chapter 26 was thinking about God and what God wants. But now he's thinking about him. He's thinking to himself. Hallelujah. And you know, that's always very dangerous. 
The Bible says there is a way that seems right to a man, but the ends there are of death. Sometimes, you know, what we think should happen is often a direct opposition to what God thinks should happen. What we think we should do is the very opposite of what God thinks we should do. And there's a, a conflict. There's doing the right thing or doing the wrong thing. There's the flesh or the spirit. Hallelujah. And that's where David is at. And we want to we, we ask the question, well, why? What, what, what was it that caused David to do that flip-flop? And, you know, we could say, well, you know, it's possible that it's all this pressure, all this people pressure forcing him to, uh, you know, to do the wrong thing. We see, obviously, his men, when they were in the cave of Adullam, and when they were in this situation in verse chapter 26, they were saying, listen, forget that biblical principle. Forget doing that godly principle. Take matters into your own hands and do what you think is right. Kill Saul. And, you know, that was maybe constant. Hallelujah. See, his men were not necessarily uh, men of wisdom. They were uh, men who were probably uneducated, many of them. And, um, you know, they were, they, were, they were loyal to David. But uh, we know that they were in distress. They were in debt. Uh, they were um, people that were, were struggling. And, you know, they were uh, maybe pushing him and, and stressing him. We also think, too, just... Um, it's now roughly about uh, eight to ten years, and David has been living from cave to cave. Uh, he's a married man. He, in fact, he's, he's two wives, his children, and so the 600 men and their wives and their children. And I'd, I'd be thinking, you know, I'm sure he was getting some pressure uh, from home saying, I'd love a house, I'd love a backyard. I'd love a normal life. I don't, I, you know, I don't want this, this life of going from cave to cave. Can you imagine living in a cave or caves for 10 years? Uh, it's, it's not particularly pleasant. And then you have the constant threat of Saul. And Saul, as I said, the last time he came with 3,000 men to crack troops to attack him. So, so David is, is under pressure. And there's maybe a, a little bit of, uh, maybe have a, a little bit of sympathy for him in this situation. But, uh, you know, but we know that David had access to, um, he had a, uh, Abiathar the priest who had an ethnod, which was a, a mechanism by which they could contact God and, 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 and seek God. I wonder why he didn't, he didn't use that. He also had on, on his disposal Abigail, and Abigail we know was a wise counselor, and yet he didn't seem that he, he, he wanted to talk to her also. But really, I think it's this, this sense of being worn down uh, that seems to be very much on his mind. And he says here in verse 1, is one of these days I'll be destroyed by the hand of Saul. One of these days I'm going to be destroyed by the... And he goes on to say, the best thing I can do is to escape. And go to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel. And I will slip out of his hand. So, you know, what, he's, what was the result of his, his, his thinking to himself was really he was going to make a decision that wasn't based on truth. Okay. Now, what David didn't, doesn't realize at this moment in time is that this season in his life is almost at a conclusion. 14 months after this decision, things are going to change dramatically. He's going to end up as the king of Judah in, uh, in Hebron. So it's almost like, you know, he's gone through this wilderness. He's gone through this testing time where God has been at work in his character, preparing him to reign as king, training him for reigning as king. And he's almost at the end, almost at the conclusion and he stops just short of the finish line. And so, you know, that, that's often the case with us too. You know, we've got to understand that, you know, there is a, a place where we need to follow through with the purposes of God. Hallelujah. Not stop and give up halfway or, or just before the, uh, the finish line. So, um, so his decision was not based on truth. 
in First Samuel chapter one, uh, verse one, it says, "One of these days I'll be destroyed by the hand of Saul." That's what he thought. Now, is that true, or is that untrue? It's untrue. You see, God had already spoken, and He said, "David, you're going to be anointed king over Israel." I have a purpose, I have a plan for you. God spoke that to the prophet Samuel. This is the truth, this is what I've got for you. But it's almost like he thought to himself, he looks to himself, and suddenly, you know, that promise just vanishes into thin air. And he forgets his destiny. See, his thoughts were based on vain imaginations. Fears, worries, and not faith. Hallelujah. You see, many times, you know, the old enemy comes to us. This is how he comes to us. He comes to us with a thought. And that thought stimulates an imagination. And that imagination then becomes a habit or an action. That action becomes a habit, and that habit becomes a destiny. That's how it works. I always remember uh, David Wilkerson uh, from Teen Challenge fame. He... He, he shared this, this illustration from, uh, it was a, a variation of uh, stuff that comes out of the, the drug world. In the drug world, they've got this, this concept of the monkey on your back. And uh, he used it, he changed it slightly, and he said, I want to share it this time in terms of monkey on your mind. And this is how it works. The parable goes, you know, you're walking along, and suddenly, you know, there's a, a little monkey that starts, you, appears. And you look at it and you think, man, that's a, that's a cute monkey. That's a cute little monkey. And you begin to walk along and the monkey starts to follow you. And it gets playing around your legs. And so you think, wow, you know, this is, this is, this is great. And so you find a, a vendor and you get some peanuts and you begin to, to feed the monkey. The monkey jumps up on your shoulder and you begin to feed the monkey as you're walking along. All along, what you're not realizing is the monkey is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. To the point where it becomes a gorilla. It's no longer a cute little monkey. It's a gorilla. And you're trying to to make your way, and it's got control over you. Hallelujah. And so, when you think thoughts that are contradictory to truth, that are destructive, and we begin to feed them. As I said, the thought becomes an imagination. The imagination becomes an action. An action becomes a habit, and a habit becomes a lifestyle or a destiny. And that's how it works. And that's where David, suddenly we're going to find him moving and changing His values, his conscience, he's going to violate, you know, he's going to be somebody completely different because he starts off by believing a lie, by believing a lie. And we know that the enemy, the devil, is the father of all lies. Hallelujah. But Jesus, his truth will set us free. Praise God. So he, the truth was he was anointed, but that just disappeared into, into thin air. He drew wrong conclusions. He says, I will be destroyed which led to another decision uh, that, that uh, was not of the Lord. Therefore, I must escape. And uh, the second thing he did, he says, he says here, the best thing I can do, the best thing I can do is escape and go to the land of the Philistines. So he thinks to himself, he thinks I'm going to be destroyed. One day Saul's going to get me. And the next conclusion is, in this process, the best thing I can do. Now, the best kind of I can do decisions are often the wrong kind of decisions. And, uh, you know, it's like uh, the best thing he could do. What about the best thing that God could do for him? What about the interventions that God has uh, applied for him in the past? Up to this very point, God has come to his rescue 12 times. Twelve times God has intervened in David's life and rescued him. Twelve times. 
He was at a point of destruction, 12 times almost at the point of death. And God comes and he rescues him. 12 times God has proven himself to him. And yet, that's gone. He's forgotten all of that. What about the intervention of the Lord? Hallelujah. See, the best thing we can do is actually seek the Lord. The best thing we can do is the right thing, not the expedient thing. And then, friends, you know, that is the challenge for every one of us. And as it, it often is a split second, a split second choice, the right thing or the wrong thing, the spirit or the flesh. And we follow through on the flesh, as I said, it leads to, to destruction. And so David decides he's going to escape. And so in his mind, he thinks, I'm going to go back a second time to Gath. I'm going to go to King Achish, who's a Philistine lord or Philistine king. And you'll remember that Gath is synonymous with Goliath. This is where this is the Goliath's hometown. And he's been there before. He did that the first time he ran away from Saul. And, uh, of course, he realized that, you know, they were going to uh, do him in because they recognized that this was David, the killer of Goliath. And he arrived there with Goliath's sword. Uh, he wasn't really thinking very clearly at all. And uh, so what he had to do in that situation was he had to pretend he was going to be mad. He, he started drooling in the mouth and acting like a madman. And King Agesh, Agesh said, look, get him out of here. Uh, we don't need a madman. Well, I've got enough, enough uh, drongos around here without having another one. Um, and so he, 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 he escapes. But now time has gone on. And I suppose in his mind he's thinking, well, Akesh knows that Saul has been after me. He knows that I've been on the run for all this time. So I'm going to try a second time to go back to uh, the Philistines. And really what this represents is back... Philistines is a picture of the world. It's a picture of the kingdom of darkness. And so he's thinking to himself, you know, the grass may be greener on the other side. He's thinking to himself, I want a bed to sleep in. I want a normal life. I want a little bit of comfort. I want a little bit of protection. And that was the decision he made. So he moves from following the course that God had for him as a destiny, and he goes back, he backslides. He goes to compromise sin, to flesh rule. And, uh, you know, there's consequences as a result because, see, friends, when we make decisions, the decisions and choices we make in life are never made in a vacuum. They're not, they're not just our decision because you have family, you have connections. You know, as a father, as a parent, as a husband, as a pastor, as a Christian, whatever your role is, and we talked about this yesterday when we were doing the, the training here, you know, every one of you are leaders, whether you like to think it or not. Every person in this room is a leader. Every person in this room has somebody who's following them. If you're a parent, you have children that follow you. If you're a leader in the church, you have people that are following you. They're, they're, they're looking to you. Whether you like it, and we, we either lead positively or negatively. We either lead you know, in, in, a, in a right way or a wrong way because they will follow us. Um, I've often shared my, my past experience was uh, in uh, social work. And uh, I always remember this family that I, I had in Australia. And uh, it was the name of Rudd, the Rudd Farmer, uh, sorry, Rudd Harmer family. And there was a, a pile of files. And I could see great grandmother, grandmother, mother, daughter, and now the, the siblings. There was about five or six generations. And you know what, you'd, what I'd find in that? The same pattern, the same issues. Because the sins of the forefathers would be visited the down to the third and the fourth generations. And friends, there are things in your family that are great and good. And you want to continue in those great and good things, those right things. 
But equally, there may be things in your family that aren't so good. A little bit of stubbornness, a little bit of pride, or different other things. And you see, we've got to understand that people are following, and they will follow. And so, you know, here, this, this decision was not made in a vacuum. David had 600 men that left with him, and not only did they, they leave uh, and settle in Gash, Gath, Gath with those, the families came with them. Let's just read here, verse 2. It says, so David and 600 men left with him and went over to Achish, the son of Magog, uh, king of Gath. And David and his men settled in Gath with Achish. Each man had his family with him. And David had his two wives, uh, Anoh- uh, Ahinum, I'm not sure I pre- pronounce that, uh, Abigail of Carmel, the widow of Nabal. And when it was told that David had fled to, to Gath, uh, Saul no longer searched for him. So as I said, David, in that split second, had made that choice, I'm out of here. I'm no longer going to follow the path that God has set for me. I'm going to follow my path. I'm going to do it my way. I'm going to go to flesh, not to the spirit. See, our decisions will influence our families, will influence our friends. And often what they have is, we see here, maybe short-term relief but long-term consequences. Hallelujah. So we see here, uh, he also, the next thing he did is is he sought the approval of King Achish, sought the approval of man. 1 Samuel chapter 27, verse 5. It says, Then David said to Achish, If I have found favor in your eyes, let a place be assigned to me, one in your country towns, that I may live there. Why should your servant live in the royal city with you? So on that day, Achish gave him Ziglag, which has, has belonged to the kings of Judah ever since. And David lived in the Philistine territory a year and four months. So here's, David is, is, is like switching allegiance. He's seeking a favor of a pagan king. He says, if I've found favor in your eyes, let me settle uh, uh, you know, give me a town in one of your country towns. And he, he says, why, doesn't your, why should your servant okay, uh, live in the city with you? So he's changing, selling out. Uh, and really to do that, something has to happen in his heart. So David in his heart, I believe what is happening is, is he's hardening his heart to the love and call of God on his life. As I said, overriding this series is this. God is after your heart. God is wanting a man or a woman that's after his heart. So God was after David's heart. God was wanting, God, I want the best for you, David. I want to use you to my glory. There's a destiny ahead for you. But David says, no, talk to the king. He hardens his heart. And he thinks to himself, I know better. The best thing I can do is escape and go to the Philistines. And then when he arrives at the Philistines, he uses language. If I've found favor in your eyes, why should your servant live in the royal city with you? And Achish gives him Ziglag, uh, the city that is uh, now has always been to the, in regards to the, um, the kings of Judah. Praise God. Hallelujah. We're going to look at, at Ziglag uh, maybe ne- the next time. Praise God. And he talks about his, that I may live there. Okay. So while he's living in the wilderness, he's living in the will of God. He's living under the blessing of God. It's not outwardly beautiful. It's, not, it's difficult outwardly. But inwardly, he's in the perfect will of God. Now he chooses he's going to live somewhere else. He's going to live in the world. He's going to live amongst the Philistines. Got, and and, and that, is, that is so dangerous because once you, once you shift in there, basically the world's values, principles begin to affect and influence you. Hallelujah. Not the other way around. You know, I'm thinking of uh, the conflict between Lot and Abraham, 
there in Genesis chapter 13. And you find that uh, there's a conflict between Lot and Abraham. And Abraham, uh, Lot, he, he says he's, he pitched his tent towards Sodom. He pitches his tent towards Sodom. And what that means is every time he came out of his tent, he sees the city of Sodom. He sees that alluring city. You know, the bright lights, the opportunities, all the things that are, and he's drawn to Sodom. A few chapters on, where do we find Lot living in Sodom? He's right smack in the middle of Sodom. And not only that, he's at the the city gates. He's involved in the, the whole government of the city. And he puts his family in jeopardy. He puts his own life in jeopardy. He puts every, everybody's life in jeopardy because he's moved into Sodom. Here David has moved to Gath. He's moved to where the, uh, the Philistines are, and he's living amongst the Philistines. And what that leads to is a, a life of compromise, as that he's, he lets go of all his values, all his principles, and he resorts back to lying. He has a lying problem as David. First Samuel chapter... Uh, 27 verses 8 to 12. He says, Now David and his men went up and raided the, the Jezurites, the Gizurites, the Amalekites. These were enemies of, of Israel. From ancient time, these people had lived uh, in the land extending, extending to Sur in Egypt. And whenever David attacked an area, he did not leave a man or woman alive, but he took sheep and cattle, donkeys uh, and clothes, and then he returned to Achish. So what he's doing is, is he's, he's robbing uh, the enemies of Israel, he's, he's like Robin Hood, if you like, um, and he's sustaining his own people through uh, the booty. And so, but then, we, but then he returns to Achish. And when Achish asks, where did you go raiding today? They would say, against the Negev of Judah, or the south of Judah, or against the Negev of Jezreel, that's the, uh, the south of Jezreel, or against the Negev of the Canaanites. And verse 11, he did not leave a man or woman alive to be brought to Gath. Here we go. For he thought, for he thought, for he thought to himself, they might inform on us, this is what David did. And such was his practice, such was his lifestyle, as long as he lived in the Philistine territory. Achish trusted David and said to him, he said to himself, he's become so odious to his people, the Israelites, that he will be forever my, uh, he'll be my servant forever. So what's happening here is this, He's living a double life. He's absolutely living a duplicitous double life. So he's giving the impression to Achish that he's fighting the Israelites. Achish asks him, where have you been? Where have you been raiding? Oh, I was down in Judah. I was down uh, with the the, the Canaanites. uh, And and, uh, where's God? I did all the, the right. Jezmerel. This is where I was. These are all places in Israel. But what he didn't tell him was actually I'm fighting Israel's enemies. I'm fighting the Amalekites. I'm fighting the, uh, the Jezerites, the Gerizites. These were enemies of, of Israel. So he was portraying something but actually doing something else. And that led Achish to believe in him. Achish believes that he's become odious to his people and that he will be you know, his servant forever. He raided the enemy, uh, the lands of, Egypt, of, of uh, Israel. So he's resorted to a life, of, a practice of lies to protect himself. Now, how many of you will know that, you know, ultimately your lies will find you out. They will, you'll be exposed. See, we can try and control, uh, we can't control the consequences of our lies. And what we find is in the... Um, Next uh, chapter in the first, first few verses here is, is, says, uh, verses 1 2, it says, In those days the Philistines gathered their forces to fight against Israel. And Agesh said to David, You must understand that you and your men will accompany me in the army. And David said, Then you will see for yourself what your servant can do. And Agesh said, Very well, I will make you my bodyguard or my guardian for life. Hallelujah. See, we can make decisions, but we can't control the outcome. And here now, David's in a position where he's going to have to fight his own people. 
because of the, the hole he's dug for himself by lying, he's going to have to face and do something he doesn't want to do. But his, his rationale, his, his, his moral compass has been so turned around that he's willing to do it. He's willing to go against his own family, his own people. And that's the, the, the outcome of, of, of the lying. So I'm just going to finish here looking just at, at, at what we must do, really, in terms of making the right decisions. First thing, when we're making decisions and thinking to, about, you know, we need to, to understand that we must, our thinking, our thoughts, our decisions must be subservient to the will of God. Life is too short to do otherwise. In James chapter 4, it says this. It says, now listen, you who say, Today and tomorrow we will go to such and such a city or spend a year and carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a, vis, a, a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it's the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. As it is, you're boasting and, you're boasting and bragging and all that boasting is evil. See, friends, if we're serious about fulfilling a destiny, a call of God upon our lives, it's God who maps out the steps. And you know, when we pray that prayer, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, that's saying, God, I want to do it your way. It's not my way. It's your way. Hallelujah. I'm not going to plan my future. I'm not going to determine my future. I'm going to submit my life to you that you will determine the future. And as you open up doors and you make those steps clear, I'm going to follow you in those steps. That's what it means to be a, a follower of Jesus Christ, a disciple of Christ. So in making our decisions, we need to be clear that it's subservient to the will of God, not my will, but thine be done. Secondly, we need a, an eternal perspective. Okay? Your life is not just three score year and ten. Hallelujah. We just don't live for the moment we live for a future. You have a legacy that you're going to pass on. There are people following you that you are impacting, whether you like it or not. In Luke chapter 12, in verse 16, it says this. And he told them a parable. This is Jesus. He said, a certain rich man produced a good crop, and he thought to himself, here's that thinking to myself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. And he said, this is what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones, and there I will store all the grain for my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of goods laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. But God says to him, you fool. This very night, your life will be demanded of you. And who will get what you prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich towards God. See, we have a tendency just to look at things just in the here and now, but not understanding that life goes on after the grave. We need an eternal perspective. Hallelujah. Paul says, these light momentary afflictions are building for me an eternal weight of glory which far outweighs them all. Hallelujah. Paul, who's going through a tough experience, says, look, if I respond rightly in the situation, if I respond in grace, if I respond in love and mercy and truth and faith and doing the right thing, what that does, it gives me an opportunity to build an eternal weight and glory. There's a heavenly deposit, a heavenly bank account that I will be rewarded with beyond the grave. You see, Paul didn't just go work for the now. He worked for the future. Hallelujah. See, what we sow, we will reap. Amen? Praise God. Thirdly, we need to embrace a biblical perspective of guidance. Re firstly, we need to realize our, our limitations. At Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 23 says, I know, Lord, that a man's life is not his own. It is not for a man to direct his steps. Hallelujah. It's God's. 
In Psalm uh, 20, 37, it says, The steps of a good man are directed by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Hallelujah. It's when God directs your life, that's when you can expect blessing and fruitfulness. Hallelujah. God has given us his word. Praise God. The word Psalm uh, 119, verse 105, it says, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my pathway. Praise God. God gives us godly advisors. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but many advisors, they would succeed. And finally, we're to seek the approval of God and not of men. Paul in Galatians says this, verse, uh, chapter 1 and verse 10. He says, am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Amen. The two are n- not possible. You either please God or you please man or yourself. When we prove, try to please men and society, you know, we end up really slaves to them. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand to our feet. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, I thank you that, Lord, you have a call on our lives. Thank you for every person in this room here this morning. Lord, my God, you brought them here not by coincidence, but by, by divine appointment. And, Lord, I thank you, Lord. There are things, oh God, that you want to sh- reveal to us. There are places that you want to take us. There are blessings, oh God, beyond our wildest imagination. But Lord, we get there your way, not our way. And we also know, Lord, there are forces, influences that want to pull us back, that want to shut out that possibility. And Lord, I pray today that, Lord, we will seek your face. We will not, Lord, settle for the best thing I can do. But rather we look to do the right thing, oh God. We choose, Lord, the spirit over the flesh. We choose to recognize that others are following us. And, Lord, my God, there's a destiny ahead of us. So I pray this morning, Lord, grace us, O Lord. Grace us, O God, to fulfill the purposes of God in this generation. Hallelujah. In this time. And when those moments come, I pray, Lord, that you'll remind us of this message. Hallelujah. Lord, bless your people, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Praise God.